what do these three pictures, I'm going to put some pictures up, what do these pictures have in common? Can you see them okay? Tommy, you want to hit the front lights, the front uh, spotlight so they can see these? We'll get there. Fronts, there we go. Can you guys see those pictures okay? What do these pictures have in common? Anybody got ideas? Chasing something bigger than yourself, okay. Anybody else? I was thinking like, okay, there's several things. Um, stupidity <laughs> would probably be one. But, but you know what, 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 what really comes to my mind is um, that all of these are pictures of extreme confidence. <laughs> that cat is probably thinking to himself, that he's about to bag the biggest canary that he's ever seen in his life. That skateboard kid, I think I've shown that picture before, I love that, it's one of my favorites. He's, I think he's got his eye on, on the Guinness Book of World Records. And the sumo kid, I'm not really sure what he's thinking. I, I really don't see how that could work out well at all. But all of these are, are, are pictures of, of extreme confidence, uh, maybe even overconfidence. You know, and uh, overconfidence is kind of a, that's kind of an interesting place to, to be. Um, there are times when overconfidence is a dangerous thing, right? Because it can get you killed uh, or at least seriously injured. But at the same time, on the other hand, you, you, you got to admire this kind of confidence, don't you? I mean, there is, a, there is a, an expectation of success that goes along with this kind of confidence. There's a, there's a feeling of certainty, you know, that goes along with that? I love that. I love that. I don't get that very often. I don't feel that, that kind of confidence very often uh, because life has, is so filled with variables. But there are times when that kind of confidence just washes over me and, and, and it opens us up to experiences that, that we may not have had otherwise, you know, when we have that kind of confidence. Or, of course, it possibly could lead you to being a snack for an eagle. It's kind of a flip of the coin. Um, you go ahead and turn the lights back on, Tom. Thank you. What, my question for you guys is, how often do you feel that sense of extreme confidence in your walk as a Christian? How often do you feel that sense of real, real extreme confidence in, in your faith, in your walk as a Christian? Because my, my bet is, my, my guess, is that for many of us who follow Jesus, we, we tend to go the other way. You know, my guess would be that we, we read in the Bible that we're supposed to be peacemakers. And we often interpret that as being mild or being soft-spoken, you know? And yet, and yet, dozens of times, if you flip through the Bible, dozens of times, God tells his followers to be confident, to be bold, to be, to be strong, you know, uh, Joshua, way back in the Old Testament, Joshua is the guy who was taken over from Moses as the one who was going to lead God's people into the promised land. That had to be an intimidating thing, don't you think? All these people that Joshua has to lead, that had to be a bit overwhelming. And yet this is what God says to him. He says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And, and the funny thing is God backs that up again and again and again. As the people move into the, into the promised land, there's a whole bunch of times when they find their backs are against the wall and it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to get out of this situation and God is the one who opens up doors sometimes at the last second to lead them into the, into the promised land. And my guess, my guess would be that if you thought about this, there's probably some of us here who have experienced something like that. You know, times when you, you almost feel like you're out of options. Like, I don't even, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And then all of a sudden, God opens up a door and it leads you to the next step. You know, we've probably, some of us have been through that before, haven't we? You know, I, I, ben, ben McGilvery is one. Um, ben is up here in the front, plays guitar, wave to him, Ben. It's just so you know, I don't think I'm making up your name. Um, ben uh, bought his business a few years ago after a lot of prayer, and, and discernment that this was the direction God wanted him to go. And, and Ben will tell you that it has, it has not been a smooth ride. It has been a bumpy ride. And there's been a couple of times, even, even recently, um, where his business has faced bankruptcy. And yet every time God opens up a door 
sometimes at the last second, to keep the business moving forward. And even now, even now, Ben will tell you that the future is dimly lit. I mean, he, he, he doesn't even know like what the next two weeks are gonna hold. And yet, and yet, Ben trusts that God is true to his word, that God led him this direction, and that God is going to come through. Man, that is, that is some confidence, isn't it? What about you and I? Are we able to have that kind of confidence? Can we have that kind of confidence in our faith? I mean, what if, what if we don't have a faith that is as strong as Ben's? Is that, is that kind of a deal breaker? You think? I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you this morning that it's not a deal breaker. In fact, do you know, if you look in the Bible, do you know how much faith Jesus says you need in order to connect into God's power? You know how much faith you need? This much? How much faith do you need? A mustard seed amount of faith. He says you need faith the amount of a mustard seed. That's this much. That's this much. Can you see that? That much faith is what Jesus says you need to connect into God's power. And my bet is that no matter where you are in your walk, in your faith walk, you've got that much faith. <laughs> the fact that you're here today says you've got that much faith. And so the question then is, why should this little tiny itty bitty amount of faith, why should this make us confident, even overconfident in God? Why should this little itty bitty amount of faith, why should that open us up to confidence in God? And I want, I want us to look at this together. If you've got a, a, a Bible with you, turn, um, turn to Mark chapter 11. Turn to Mark 11 if you've got a Bible. If you, don't, you got a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, grab one out of the pews in front of you. On the blue Bibles, it's on page 841. Um, maroon large print, 1558. But you, if you've got a phone, you know, your, your cell phone or tablet or something, feel free to use that as well. Mark chapter 11 is what we're going to look at. Mark chapter 11. Um, if, always feel free to bring your Bibles with you too, guys. I love that. But if you, if you don't have one or forgot it, you know, grab one of the pew Bibles in front of you. This, this story that, that we're looking at in Mark 11, this happens um, right after Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem for the last week of his life. Okay, it's, it's what we, in the church, what we call Holy Week. Um, and it's when, it's when Jesus begins on Palm Sunday comes into Jerusalem and it, and it culminates on, on Easter morning. And uh, so this is the first day. On, on Sunday, he comes into Jerusalem. He kind of gets the lay of the land and then he goes to bed. And then this is what happens the next day. So this would be Monday morning of, of Holy Week. And I want you to look at verse um, 12, okay? Verse 12. And this is what it says. It says, The next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Okay, now I want you to skip ahead a little bit. In, in between, Jesus goes into the temple and people are like selling animals for sacrifices. They're treating the temple like a marketplace and Jesus like f turns the tables over and kicks them out and tries to get them to focus again on, on keeping the temple holy. Um, but then skip down to, to verse uh, 20. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree that Jesus had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day, and he exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything and if you believe that you have received it, it will be yours. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone that you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. I like the, the little section that we skipped about you know, Jesus clearing out the temple. It's important and I think Jesus is saying something to us about the way we treat God's temple, you know, his temple here, and also this temple, right? Because the Bible says that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us. So I think the way that we treat that temple says a lot about the way that we honor God. But what I really want us to focus on is that the, the part about the fig tree. 
You know, before it cleans out, clears out the temple and after that. And, um, you know, that first little section, I'm, I'm intrigued by, by this. I don't want to debate this. I do not want to debate this. But I'm intrigued by the reason that Jesus curses the fig tree, even though it says it was too early for the fig tree to produce figs. All right? It was, it was too early, and Jesus was hungry, and it didn't have any figs, so he cursed it anyway. Why, why would he do that? I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe he was in a grumpy mood. Um, but I am very interested in what happens at the end when, they, when the disciples notice that the fig tree has withered and died. And Jesus encourages them to believe in the power of prayer and to even believe that the prayers are being answered as they are praying them. That's deep, isn't it? That, I mean, that is, this is some powerful stuff that Jesus is talking about. And if you look in, in the Bible, there's, this is not the only time that Jesus encourages us to be bold and confident in our prayers, right? In, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, he says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks receives finds and to everyone who knocks the door will be opened and my, my guess would be when you look at these passages about about boldness in prayer my guess would be that not very many of us look at prayer that way and my my question is why not why not i mean you know jesus god himself tells us to ask seek knock believe that you are receiving this and it will be done for you he tells us to do that. So why, why then do our prayers often resemble a plea to God, hoping that maybe we catch God in a bad mood or in a good mood? You know, why do we do that? I mean, it, it, when we choose not to have confidence and boldness in our prayers, is this the way, is this the way that God wants it to be? You know, Jesus, Jesus tells us to believe that we have received what we ask for in prayer. And yet oftentimes, I don't know if this is true for you, but oftentimes we kind of catch ourselves on our knees going, please, God, please, 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 please do this for me, please, please. Is that what it means to be bold in the Lord? I mean, you know, come on. What, what, what is it that keeps us from expecting answers to our prayers? What is it that keeps us from being bold in our prayer life? What is it that keeps us from doing that? I've, I've got a couple of theories on this, on why this seems so weird to us to be bold in our prayers. And, and I've got an idea on, on how to fix it, if, if you're interested. Um, I think my, my guess would be that praying with boldness seems odd to us, probably for two basic reasons. One, one reason would be that we've never told, we've never been told or taught to be bold in our prayers. We've never been taught that, you know? And the other reason is, I think, probably that we've tried it and we didn't get the response we wanted, and so we stopped. You know, those would be my, my guesses why we don't. We, we're not taught to be bold. My, I don't know if this is true for you guys. When someone first taught you how to pray, when you were taught what prayer is like, a lot of times I think we're taught that prayer is like putting in um, a comment in God's suggestion box that he keeps up in heaven. You know, I write a little comment on there and I put it in God's suggestion box and I hope that at some time God's gonna sift through there and pull out my suggestion and go, you know, that's a good idea. I think I'll do that. You know, we, don't you think we kind of treat prayer like we're asking for a favor from someone who has the power to withhold the favor? And so we ask and we plead. Is that how Jesus dealt with prayer? Is that how he treated it? He, he never did. Jesus was, didn't treat prayer like that. He was bold in his prayer. He was confident in his prayers. And you know what we're told in the Bible? We're told to do the things that Jesus did. It, we are. And yet if we're never taught to be bold in our prayers, if we're never taught that, then we keep just putting our suggestions in God's suggestion box, hoping that maybe at some time we might get an answer. So I think that's one reason that people aren't very bold with prayers. But the other reason is, is that sometimes I think we, we, we have probably um, tried this before. We've tried to ask with confidence and we didn't get the response that we wanted. And so we, we either stopped praying entirely or else we went back into a safe mode of, of praying. That's probably, that's probably why. And I wanna talk more about that. I wanna talk more about that later. But for the next couple of minutes um, this morning, I want to give, uh, give you an idea 
on how to be bold in your prayers, how to develop boldness in your prayers. And then, and then next week, next week, I want to I wanna talk about what happens when we don't feel like we're getting answers to our, to our prayers. What happens when it doesn't feel like it's working out well, okay? That sound good? Today is boldness in prayer. Next week is what happens when we don't get answers. Sound good? All right. So let me, I, I want to I start by telling you that what I'm going to share with you is not, it's not my, this is not my idea. This is, comes, comes from Jesus himself, okay? But if you look in this section from Mark here today, Jesus is pretty clear on the first step in prayer. The first step in boldness of prayer. This is what he says. He says, when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Right? If, if you want boldness in your prayer, if you want confidence in your prayer life, what we have to do is we've got to remove any barrier that keeps God's power from reaching us. Right? That, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, the whole purpose of an, um, of an umbrella is to keep rain from hitting us. We have things in our lives that provide barriers that keep God's power from reaching us. And what Jesus is saying is forgiveness is a big one. It's a big one that we carry with us. And he says that's the place to start. If you want God, God's power to reach you, we, we've got to start with, with forgiveness. We've been having, uh, we've been having issues at, at our house lately with uh, our hot water heater. It's, it's, it's not producing very much hot water, which is kind of its purpose, right? And so I go online and I start looking up all these websites to find out, like, well, what do you do about this when your hot water is running out quickly? What do you do? And all the websites I go to, every single one of them, every single one, has the first thing that you try is always the same. The first thing it says to do is to flush out the sediment that gathers at the bottom of the hot water tank. All of them say to do that. Flush out the sediment. Because apparently over time, dirt and sediment kind of sift, sift in there and, and it, it settles down to the bottom of your hot water heater. And so the more sediment that builds up in your hot water tank, the more that builds up, the less room there is for hot water. That makes sense? Right? That seems logical, doesn't it? You know what Jesus says? He says our lives are like that. He says, we, we, over time, we develop, we build up all this junk in our lives. And the more junk we have built up in our lives, the less room there is for God's power. And so he says, before you start praying with boldness, before you start doing that, the first thing that you've got to do is make room in your tank for God's power to fill you. And so he says, first of all, forgive anyone that you're holding a grudge against. That is our way of flushing out the sediment. That's our way of doing that, flushing out the sediment so that more of God's power can fill our lives. Now, forgiving others, I, it's, I, I don't want to pretend that this is an easy thing. It, it's not. This is a big thing. It's a hard thing. You could do a whole Sunday just on, on forgiveness, and, and, we, and we should do that. But for today, I want you to just start with the understanding that by, by forgiving others that you hold a grudge against, what you're doing is you're starting with a clean slate. You're trying to flush out the negative stuff so that more and more of God's power can fill you. Our goal, our goal is to release people um, from a debt that they owe us, right? Our goal is to get rid of anger in our hearts, to get rid of, of, of anxiety and frustration. Our goal is to allow peace to lead our prayers rather than negative emotions to lead our prayers. Because all that negative stuff, that anger, frustration, anxiety, that's, that's the junk that clogs up space in our prayer hot water tank, all right? So, so the first thing Jesus says to do is to forgive people that you, hold, that you hold a grudge against. So what you wanna do then is when you start to pray, but when you sit down, imagine the people in your life that irk you. This doesn't make sense, does it? When, when, usually when we pray, we just get right into the things that we want. But Jesus says don't do that. Start with the people that irritate you. Start with the people that frustrate you and, and picture them in your mind. Picture them in your mind. Don't, don't just lump them all together, you know, all the people that irritate me. Name them. Picture them in your mind. These people that bother you, people that have hurt you, picture them in your mind. Gather them and then allow God's light to shine on them. Allow God's light to fill them. And imagine God's joy filling them and his love filling them and his grace filling them. And then I want you to go through and I want you to name each one of them and bless them in Jesus' name. Bless each one of them in Jesus' name. These are the people that you don't like, people that irritate you. Bless them. And this is the first step in forgiving them. 
This is the first step in doing that. It's not, it's not easy to do. It is not easy, and it takes practice to do this. But the more you do this, the more you are flushing out the junk from your lives that will allow more of God's power to come in. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, just logically, doesn't this make sense? That if we want God's power to fill us, we've got to get rid of the negative stuff. And Jesus says, forgiving people is what allows more of God's power to come into you. Okay? So this is how we prepare to pray with, with confidence and pray with boldness. And once you do that, the, the next thing that you do, the next step, is to ask God. That seems ridiculously obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> that when I'm talking about prayer, that I need to ask God. But, but listen to what Jesus says. Listen to what he says. Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. Wow. Have faith in God, he says. Have faith in God. You know what I find sometimes that I'm doing when, I, when, I'm, when I'm praying? What I find that I'm doing sometimes is just rattling off a wish list. You know, I wish I had this. I wish I had this. I wish I had this. Instead of asking God for what I need, I'm just rattling off a bunch of wishes. You know, when, when Jesus says, have faith in God, this is a huge part of praying with boldness because it, it reminds me that it is not my power that brings about the answer to a prayer, but I am reliant on God. And you know something? God loves me. I know he loves me, and I know he wants what is best for me, so what would stop me from having confidence that God is providing what I need? What, what would stop me from doing that? Do you know that when you pray, Every time you pray, you are walking into the throne room of your heavenly Father who cannot wait to sit with you. God adores every particle of your being and he controls the world. <laughs> I mean, what, when you imagine that, what would stop you from having faith that God wants what is best for you? What would stop you from asking God for what you need? Now, there's a difference between what we need and what we want, right? And we'll talk about some of that next week. But if you believe that God loves you and is powerful, what in the world would keep you from asking God for what you need? Don't be timid in your prayers. Don't be timid. Be bold. Tell God what you need. I mean, we're told this in Scripture, right? This isn't going, I'm not, I'm not pushing the boundaries of Scripture. Jesus tells us, ask, seek, Knock. He tells us to do this. He doesn't say, plea with God for what you need. Tell God what you need. Ask, seek, knock, be bold. Okay? Good? The last thing that Jesus tells us to do uh, is clearly the hardest. <laughs> he goes, but you must really believe that it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you have received it, it will be yours. Wow. Now, I'll tell you what. I am not one of, those, uh, one of those scammers who will tell you that if you have not received something that you prayed for, it means you don't have enough faith. I'm not going to tell you that. Some people will tell you that, and I think that's a load of, that's a load of something. <laughs> but, but Jesus is really clear, isn't he, when he says, believe that you have received what you ask for. Believe that you have received it. What Jesus is doing is he's challenging us to expect that God is already at work giving us the things that we have been bold enough to pray for. You know, this is, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm speaking on, for myself here. This is partly what keeps me from praying for a brand new Corvette to magically appear in my driveway. You know, I, this is what keeps me from doing that. I can ask for it. I can ask for it. I have a, I, I, I don't know how I can really truly honestly believe that it would actually happen. You know, and this is the difference. This is the difference between believing that God is a slot machine and believing that God is the architect of a master plan to redeem this world and renew this world and everyone and everything in it. God is not your sugar daddy. God is God. And his primary concern, his number one concern, is rescuing every soul from the grip of the devil. That is his primary concern. And if you're on board with that plan and you're a part of that plan, why in the world would you be asking for something as silly and trivial as a new car to magically appear in your driveway? You know, if, if I have cleared my slate by forgiving people that I hold a grudge against and if I'm asking God for the things that I need, what would 
possibly keep me from believing that God is giving me the things that I need? What would keep me from, from moving forward expecting that God is answering those prayers? You know, this is probably the biggest part, I'm guessing, of boldness in prayer is believing that God is answering the prayers as I'm praying them. This is hard. It, it does not happen automatically. But as you, as you do this, God knows your heart, you guys, and as you, as you practice boldness in your prayer, God isn't going to encourage you, you know? It doesn't happen all at once. My, I mean, my kids, my kids did not automatically understand the depth of my love for them, right? It didn't, boom, it didn't magically happen. They learned to trust that I was true to my word to them. They learned to trust that I will bless them with everything that I am. They learned to trust that I'm always watching out for their best interests. That is what we learn about God as we practice boldness in our prayers. All right, the, I mean, the fact that this is a process, that it doesn't happen all at once, I mean, it means that there's gonna be, there's gonna be setbacks for us. There's times when it, it doesn't feel like it's gonna click in as, as well as we want it to. It, that, that's understandable. We don't want to get discouraged in those times. And that's why next week, next week I want to talk about what happens when we feel like the prayers aren't connecting the way they should. You know, why am I not getting the answers that I feel like I should be getting when there's a, maybe there's a break in the, in the prayer pipeline or something. So we'll talk about that next week. But for this week, I want you guys to practice this. You know, take some time to prepare yourself for boldness in prayer and, and forgive those that you hold a grudge against. Ask God for what you need and move ahead expecting that God has given you the answer. We should expect that God is answering our prayers. We should expect that. We should be bold in our prayers. So I want to hear some stories about this. I want to hear stories. I want you guys to be doing this and practicing this and I want us to share this because I want us together to be able to give glory to God who makes us bold. I'm going to invite you to pray with me this morning as our ushers come up to collect our offering. God, make us bold. Make us bold.